Our sponsor for this session is GR Energy Services. Completion, production, and water management. Please visit their page in our sponsor showcase tab. We all know how valuable the Haynesville play is to producers. We also know its value to the state of Louisiana and the United States. That's why we're here, of course, and why you're watching. With its proximity to LNG exports, facilities, and Henry Hub pricing, the play is vital to energy independence and to the oil and gas industry. But what's next for the industry and this play? Where is the demand heading? Will storage be available? What's the regulatory outlook? Katie Heyer joins us to talk about all of this. She is Vice President of Communications for the Louisiana Oil and Gas Association and hosts the weekly Louisiana Drilling Report available on LOGA's YouTube channel. Katie, what are we in for? Hey, thank you so much for having me, Lynn. I'm glad to be here. You know, I go around all over the state Zooming and uh, once upon a time in person to get to tell everybody about our wonderful industry. And 2020 has been such a punch to the gut. You know, I don't often um, have to tell use the word crisis, but um, when I describe our industry, it comes up a bit. And as everybody in your audience knows, 2020 has been the perfect storm. Oil supply, as you know, in March of this year was completely flooded when uh, international players in OPEC, including Russia and Saudi Arabia, decided they were going to try to displace the American energy producer. And then at the same time, the pandemic hit and demand completely crashed through the floor. So prices could only go one direction and that was down. So the industry has been left reeling as a result. And we've seen for, um, for oil specifically in this slide that the surplus is at record levels and we're continuing to see a mighty surplus. Um, even as OPEC continues talks and we try to figure out what the global oil market is gonna be like, the bottom line is so much was put on the market this spring that it's going to take a long time a long time to, um, to rebalance the market. And you can see over the past two and a half decades, almost 30 years in this chart, that the surplus and the deficit was always pretty balanced in comparison to just 2020 alone. OPEC did say that they were going to make historic cuts, but those cuts were not nearly enough for what we needed to bring the market back into balance. And so what we have seen is brutal, brutal unadulterated market forces. IHS market um, mentioned if there is no international agreement to curtail oil production, then brutal unadulterated market forces will bring the oil market back into balance. The laws of supply and demand are fierce in extreme conditions. And we've seen that play out. You know, the headlines every week go back and forth, volleying between OPEC is going to have a new agreement versus OPEC decides to keep supply completely oversupplied. You cannot really predict what they're going to do. And we've seen that play out over the past few months as we, as we wait to see what will truly happen. And so they did do a historic cut, but that historic cut in May was nowhere near what was needed to overcome that surplus. So we are still waiting for the market to balance back out. And you probably remember, everyone in the audience remembers uh, that very, very difficult April when storage became a problem and talks about needing to use the strategic petroleum reserve became emergency measures to try to help um, empty up some space so that people could actually take their product somewhere when it was actually severed from the ground. One of our members told us that they got word that they'll, they were no longer even going to have a market for it at the end of April. And they said, we'll look to see what other options we might have. We might need to shut in fields once the tanks are full. And we did end up seeing that. And I'll share with you some of our survey numbers in a little bit that go exactly over that. Now, what does that mean for prices if you have way too much supply and because of the pandemic, almost no demand, right? No one's getting on cruise ships. People are starting to fly again, but it's still pretty limited. And at one point, 
there were even travel bans over the summer. We all know this, and we, even though we are slowly creeping back into some kind of normal, we're still in a pandemic new normal. And so demand is still greatly reduced. So what we ended up seeing this spring was a 300% decrease in price in one day. And that was the first time we ever saw that oil traded negative. It closed at $37 negative, which is just insane. It's saying, instead of selling my mar my product on the open market, I will, I will ask somebody, I will pay somebody to take it from me. So that was um, Black April, as, as we say. So what are we looking forward toward the future for oil prices? Well, a lot of economists agree it's gonna be at least until 2022 or longer. Now, anything could happen in 2021, anything. We could get a vaccine. We could completely uh, find that the virus has been contained in a way that people are confident about traveling again. Anything is possible. 2021, we could see prices recover, but a lot of economists agree it's not gonna be till 2022 or longer. So when I do that weekly drilling report you mentioned, thanks for the shout out, I look at prices every week. And ever since August, uh, crude oil hasn't broken $40 for longer than a week or two. And then natural gas prices have remained incredibly low as well. And so as we look for what's going to happen, it, a lot of it depends on that new normal. What does that demand look like in a new normal period? And it has been a ride for natural gas. I mean, if you just look at the chart, you can see prices are all over the place. We had a low of 160 in March. It's been even lower since then. You can see it falls off the chart below that. Uh, we've seen $1.50 uh, in, recent, in recent weeks. But I'd like to point out, everybody here knows $2.77 is not good. That's still barely hanging on. If we had $4, $4.5, $5 uh, per MCF, we would be talking about something where people could make those capital investments, where we could see growth and expansion. Right now, people are just hanging on. There's a spirit of resilience that I see everywhere when I talk to my members but I can't sugarcoat it. It is very difficult right now. And you know, everybody in your audience knows that a good crude marker, a good visualization of how is investment in our industry going is the rig count. That's why I do that report every week so we can really drill down into, well, how are we doing? And since the COVID-19 pandemic, we have less than halved our rig count across the nation. A, a year ago, about 12, 14 months ago, we were at 1,100 rigs at one point. This shows 1,000 rigs a, a year ago. We're at 269 today nationwide. So that just shows you how crunched down that rig count really is. And each week we see it inch up by one rig, two rigs. Sometimes it stays the same week by week, but it is. it was very quick to shut down and it'll be very slow to come back online. So we wanted to know how is the pandemic, how is 2020 truly impacting our Louisiana members? And so we asked all of our members across Louisiana, who by the way, represent about 90% of the independents in the industry. We represent the explorers and the producers as well as their service sector. And so they told us that they needed about $37 $37 was their break-even price of oil. And that varies by company, of course, but that's the industry average that we got from our members. When it comes to natural gas, we need at least $2.01. Two weeks ago, I reported that we were only at $1.89. Three weeks before that, I think we had shot up to $2.89. It is really quite the roller coaster for natural gas week to week. And we know that as winter comes back around, there, there will be greater demand. And so we can expect those prices to come up a little bit, but we're still waiting to see what that's gonna look like. So what can we do? What can we do to help our members in Louisiana? There is a laundry list of things that need to be fixed in this state or improved at the very least when it comes to taxation or regulation or litigation. But right now we're in a special session. Lawmakers have convened to try to help 
figure out the uh, government's response to emergency preparedness in Louisiana during the pandemic, how we're gonna handle pandemic crises. And one of the things that has come up, and I'm jumping down to the second bullet here, is a incentive to drill by, su by suspending a severance tax. Now, this would be to incentivize new drilling. So once your, your startup costs had been recovered, then that severance tax would, that it would come back on. So we're seeing this go through the process. Last I heard it had passed through the house. We're waiting to see it in Senate committee, I believe is, is the latest of, about that bill. And the other huge thing that we're working on right now is to convince everybody to vote yes on constitutional amendment two. Now, Lynn, if I read this to you, you'd probably fall asleep in your chair. But essentially, Constitutional Amendment 2 asks voters to agree to put fairness and predictability into the Constitution for Louisiana's oil and gas wells. And I'll come back to that in just a second. I've told you all about what we've seen, what has happened to the market. So what does that actually mean in terms of people, our teams, our workforce, our economy. Well, back when the pandemic had was just in its early, early days, there were almost 34,000 producing wells. Today, there are 31,911. And of those, about 10% are directly in the Haynesville. Now, this is not surprising because when you look at our activity in Louisiana, week after week, Every single week, the only place we have any activity is in the Haynesville. There's almost never anything in South Louisiana inland waters or South Louisiana land. And in state offshore waters, we don't have anything. In federal offshore, we have 12 rigs. Always, not always, but lately, the only thing we can rely on is that there's activity in the Haynesville. I think as of last count, we had 26 uh, rigs in the, in the Haynesville. And then here we can see we have 3,100 wells. So that's about 10% of the producing wells in the state. So that's a huge deal. And what we're seeing in 2020 has economic consequences, the likes of which we have never seen before, including we know we have $3.2 billion in wages every year, thanks to our industry. If you look at the Shreveport area, that's, that's a pretty good close enough indicator for when we say the Haynesville, even though that, that, that's a pretty broad area, we're talking about almost half a billion dollars in wages, $425 million in wages. And of those at risk, are almost $300 million. That is a huge, huge economic risk because Dr. Lauren Scott has shown that for every single job in our industry, for every one job in our industry, 3.7 more are created outside of the industry. That's because our field pays the highest weekly wage of any in Louisiana. And so as we pay our people, we go on and we buy things from florists, we go to dentists, we buy real estate, we buy cars. All of that turns into 3.7 more jobs for every job that we have. So for every job that we lose, the multiplier effect is, is even greater. This year has been rough in so many ways, so much so that uh, a, new, a new report came on our radar and that's the Haynes and Boone's bankruptcy monitor. They have reported that as of this year, we have seen a 66% increase in bankruptcies, just looking at year over year data. Now, this is a, a really sad slide. I hate the slide. <laughs> Uh, but if you look at the news, if you, if you read different news sites, you'll see mergers and acquisitions are in the headlines a lot as companies scale back or realize they have to do something different because we're simply in a price environment that is exceedingly low. It makes it very, very difficult for people to survive. I have heard our members tell us that either they've had to, of course they've had to stop doing overtime, I told you already four out of five had begun shutting in wells after the price crash, crash in April. And I've had one of my members tell me that he hadn't taken a paycheck. He himself had not taken a paycheck just so he could keep his, keep his workers. It is rough. So what can we do? Obviously we can't convince the whole world to 
uh, get on a cruise ship or go on an airplane. Of course not. We can't fabricate demand and we can't convince Saudi Arabia and Russia to stop oversupplying the market. Although there are a lot of conversations going on at the federal government to try to get OPEC to cooperate better. And of course we hear in the headlines every, every week, there are new advancements in the vaccine and as, as different states move back toward uh, regular life, demand will increase again. The only question is when, how long is our recovery going to take? So in the meanwhile, what can we do? I've told you about House Bill 29. This is by Philip de Villiers. He has said we need to incentivize new drilling. The litigation environment in our state is so tough. The taxation environment in our state is so difficult. Regulatory burdens are so high. These are all costs and risks to employers when they try to come to the state. So if we could incentivize new drilling by doing a severance tax exemption for just two years or however long it takes to cover the cost of drilling that new rig, that new well, excuse me, that would help incentivize more people to come back here and spend their money here in Louisiana and do activity here in Louisiana. And then the second thing, and this is so important, is that everybody vote yes on Constitutional Amendment 2. Constitutional Amendment 2 asks, do you approve the inclusion, the inclusion of production of oil or gas for the purposes of ad valorem tax assessments, ad valorem assessments on oil and gas wells? All this means is this is a fairer way to value an oil or gas well. These wells are already valued, but using a inappropriate method. For example, the replacement cost new method. I know this part is very complicated uh, policy-wise, but really it makes a lot of sense. If I had two identical wells, but one produced 10 barrels a day, one produced 1,000 barrels a day, well, you and I would agree the one that produces 10 times more, 100 times more, 1,000 times more, whatever that number is, is more valuable. Assessors are not allowed to take that element into consideration when they value an oil and gas well. The bottom line is that means some have been vastly overassessed and some have been wildly underassessed. The Assessors Association and industry, after battling this out for decades, have come together in agreement behind Constitutional Amendment 2. It allows the use of the income approach. So it's more predictable for businesses and for parishes. It's fair for everybody. And everybody has this unified goal of having a more predictable, fairer, more accurate assessment of an oil and gas well. These assessments already exist. This is just a change to the methodology that the assessors use to get to that valuation. Assessors as an industry are behind it. And I am so glad to share that so is everybody else. When this constitutional amendment was a bill going through the legislative process this spring, it got unanimous yays in the House, unanimous yays in the Senate, and it breezed through. Not a single nay vote was against this constitutional amendment. So important, so easy. It's a great thing for fairness and predictability. And a number of my members have told us constitutional amendment two is key to keeping their wells alive. I have someone in the Monroe gas field who said his super stripper wells, they are looking at a very harsh future if this does not pass. But if Constitutional Amendment 2 passes, then their wells will live for a little while longer. And it is so important that we vote yes on it. So what's coming up? What's in the future? Of course, we've talked about the importance of a better price environment. We've talked about how we don't know, nobody knows what new the new normal is going to look like with COVID 2.0. And if, uh, if demand goes back down because people have to go back and stay at their houses and school goes virtual again during the winter when that's typically cold and flu season. And then of course we have a presidential election right around the corner with whenever there are new faces, we're gonna see new policies or uh, what would happen um, in any election when new people come to, uh, come to elected office. So the good news is no matter who is elected, uh, we are going to remain an important, crucial part of our economy, of our energy provision 
for the long time future to come. So we're excited um, about Constitutional Amendment 2. We're excited about HB 29. We encourage everybody to vote yes on two. We're on every social media. If you want to connect with us, we would love to connect with you guys. And I am happy to take any questions, Lynn, if we have any time for it. Let me know. We certainly do. And I got some for you. But right. before I get into that, I, you know, you can tell me industry-wise, but also non-industry-wise. I'm sitting over here in Houston, and obviously we dodged all of the storms this year that you yeah. guys got. So, I mean, how has that really affected things over in Louisiana? Not just for the industry, but, you know, as well. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things on the coast got yeah. really wrecked. What a year we have had. Six hurricanes have come through Louisiana in some way, uh, form or fashion this year. It's been insane. Um, we've, from an industry standpoint, I get, I get to be um, a witness to the incredible job we get to do as an industry that puts boots on the ground, that puts gas cards in people's hands, that helps feed people and take care of people, make sure there are volunteers out there to help with shelter. So uh, for some communities, these storms have been absolutely devastating. And everywhere I look, industry has been there to help them uh, repair, recover, and just uh, bounce back stronger than ever. So nobody wishes another storm system like 2020s. Uh, but industry definitely has played an incredible role already in recovery. That's for sure. A little bit more back to uh, industry metrics. Uh, you, you brought up obviously prices. I'm really interested in your your member uh, membership survey. Um, you know, some of the analysts I've talked to, those numbers are actually looking a little higher for next year. Uh, maybe three dollars, three. You know, I've seen some people as high as three forty. So yeah, I mean, that'd be awesome. are, yeah. Like, so are, I mean, are your members still pretty bullish about the coming years for nat natural gas in the Haynesville? Yeah, I have seen a number of different analyses talk about how we're going to see a boon. We're uh, we're going to see a possibly really good price market next next spring, next summer. That would be incredible because then we could see projects coming back online. We could see people being rehired. You know, when it comes to these big, really big capital expenditures like the LNG projects, those projects take five years um, on average at a minimum to get started. And then they're online for 20, 30 years. And so there are a lot of big projects that have been put on pause because of the pandemic. And as prices recover, we're, we could see those jobs come back, those wages come back, those investments come back, which we really need and I'm really excited to see for sure. So CA2, tell me, I, I know it got all kinds of support in the legislature and so forth. How's any idea what, what to expect when people vote for it? I have had nothing but excellent, excellent feedback on Constitutional Amendment 2. Once people realize this is not a tax, this is not creating a new tax base. This is simply making fairer, making more predictable a method. So assessors can use three methods to evaluate property values, but for oil and gas wells, they are the single property in Louisiana that doesn't get to use the income method. Once people realize that, hey, that doesn't make any sense and okay, this is gonna right a lot of wrongs, they jump right on board. The advocate in uh, South Louisiana has endorsed it. The Council for a Better Louisiana has endorsed it. We've got endorsements from the, uh, the Monroe Chamber, from Bastrop Monroe Chamber. We've got endorsements. They're just flying in all over the place. So I'm really excited about it. We're hearing lots of great feedback. Okay. So if it, do, if it does pass, when would it really start to take effect? And what, I mean, how, yeah. I guess, what is the effect of bringing back those wells that have been on pause? I mean, no, that's, that, that's such a great question. If it passes, what happens next? So if you say yes to Constitutional Amendment 2, Louisiana, this is the green light for us to start having the conversation around what does the income approach look like for oil and gas wells? So at the earliest in the summer, the Louisiana Tax Commission will hold 
public hearings where people can weigh in on what they think that actual application should look like. Assessors and industry and anybody else from the public is welcome to attend these public meetings where uh, these conversations take place. After that, it will be a few years before the actual methodology is developed and finessed. So we'll start to see those changes in the next four or five years. And when that happens, someone who has say sold a well for $5 million will no longer be assessed on an artificial value of $80 million as is the case today. So if it passes, we will see a lot fairer in a lot fairer assessments. Today, some wells have been vastly undervalued and those parishes are missing out on those dollars. And some wells have been vastly overvalued, which is not fair at all for those small mom and pops, those independent producers, for anybody trying to stay in business and keep people employed. So this green light is so important. And uh, if everybody wants to be there, you should check out those uh, summer meetings starting in summer 2021, hopefully if we get that green light. And keep um, speaking of keeping people employed, you showed a lot of numbers about the effect of the price decline and so forth. So I, how do those jobs get replaced if they go away? Do they get replaced at all? I mean, how, how important are those jobs to Louisiana? And, and the oh, those economy? jobs are so important. It's hard to overstate the importance of the oil and gas industry, the oil and natural gas industry in Louisiana. Like I mentioned, almost four more jobs are created for every single job in our industry. And I believe our country has lost about 100,000 oil and gas jobs in the, in the pandemic. Now, as projects come back online, those jobs are starting to come back little by little, but slow and steady. Um, you know, when, uh, when people have good jobs, they can stay in Louisiana. When litigation or uh, the absence of uh, a workable industry happens in in Louisiana, people, people have to move. They have to go to Texas, they go to Oklahoma, they go to Mississippi and Alabama. So it's bigger than just an economic conversation. It's a cultural conversation too, because if our people have to get up and leave, well, you know, our Louisiana culture goes with them. So it's a huge conversation, it's a huge deal. And uh, every time I see a report that says jobs are recovering, prices are recovering, it makes me excited. And so I'm optimistic and so are our members for the future. Wonderful. Katie, thank you for being with us today. Every time I meet somebody from Louisiana, they ask me if I'm related to whoever, whoever founded Vermilion Parish. I have no connection whatsoever, but I get to ask that all the time. Yes, I'm going to, I, going to have to go live there, I guess. You're going to have to go check it out. <laughs> incredible place. Uh, well, <laughs> if they pass the bill and the jobs come back, I'll come. Anyway, nice having you. Thank you for being with us today. And we'll hey, talk thank to you guys, guys so much for having me.